ladies and gentlemen a very good evening to all of you gathered out it's very holy and pious auditorium named professor nuchans of auditorium of this university and those who are present mostly over here i welcome you all to the very first professor nuchans memorial lecture by justice ak sc the former judge supreme court of india on a very crucial and the relevant theme that is on fundamental duties i would say a topic very near to the heart of great soul and our mentor let me at outset admit the very fact by borrowing the words of professor upendra bakshi who while paying his tribute to professor mulchan sharma in his last published work that was on article 370 fortunately i am holding it now now in my hand he said that uh, he is i quote rather it is like many of us difficult to speak of professor mulchan sharma in past tense but you know we must accept ourselves to the fact on the stage of his miles that we must gonna encounter and today it happens to be the second anniversary of his sad demise so we are here to celebrate the memory of a person who in many ways made an impact on most of us through his work through his words wisdom humility modesty reserve and dedication as a teacher as an administrator and as a policy maker i would say he didn't bind himself in the set rigid ways of you know rules and the thinking of an academician he was beyond that professor mulchan sharma an established scholar who had worked extensively in the area of constitutional jurisprudence law economy and political science with a multidisciplinary approach i would say professor mulchan sharma a doyen of law a thinker an institution builder and about them all a great teacher who could inspire many generation of law students and legal luminaries including the chief guest of the day if i am not wrong for an fierce career he held many diverse position including vice chairperson of university grant commission founder vice chancellor of this very institute director of national law institute university bhopal full time member of law commission of india joint registrar of supreme court of india has been closely associated with the nhrc and even with the president house and to celebrate that memory we really couldn't have a better speaker than justice ak sikri i would say inspiring career as a law teacher as a successful lawyer and a great judge who remained on the bench for more than two decades we extend our heartfelt thanks to you justice uh, mr justice ak sikri ji we are privileged to have the family members of professor sharma his better half mrs dr pawan sharma his son mr varun his daughter miss divya who have been carrying forward the great legacy of a great man we welcome you all also let me take this opportunity to share that we are in debt to our worthy vice chancellor professor tankeshwar kumar who could ignite flame in our hearts to our thinking and organizing an event in the memory of professor mulchan sir professor tankeshwar kumar i would say bluntly match so many similarity with professor sharma when we talk of humility modesty and the working culture in the office of which is acted of this particular university in central us may i now request our worthy vice chancellor for his welcome address please sir please first of all i thank justice arjun kumar sikri ji who has accepted the invitation to be keynote speaker today and i understand today we are starting it is discovery okay the first professor moonchan sharma memorial lecture so if i am putting the word first and i understand there will not be any last to this so it will continue and continue so it is 
you know, university led many, many hundred years. And we should see that the foundation is very important for any institution. As I could see, we have the expectation from this university because its foundation has been very, very important. And we can see here the founders, the students, and we can also see many of my, if I say that maybe my teachers are there, you know, I am also from Punjab University. And I remember that he used to visit our uh, university, Punjab University, many times. And we knew him about the work is about the human rights rights, the very well from the physics side. But you know, we knew him as a person for human rights. And finally, when he became the vice chancellor of this university, then we were very happy that this university, at the Central University of Canada, which is going to be the member that will be, you know, helping the Haryana to grow and helping this country, which is uh, in the I know if this is in the NCA region. So with the uh, expectation, I think the family has, I'm really thankful to uh, Dr. Pawan Sharma and uh, her daughter, you know, who you know, have the expectation that this university should be among the you know, world-class university. And I'm happy to share that this university has reached the uh, milestone when it ranked among the 151 and 200 universities of the country. And, you know, it appears maybe in the first few, maybe first or second university of the, those universities which were established at that time, 15 universities were established, maybe we are number one or two. So we have to it and we see that in our lifetime, this university will definitely will be in the ranking of the world or maybe the first 500 universities of the world. And I am hoping that my students and my teachers here sitting here will contribute to the, that extent so that we can really make a difference and we can have the expectations of that who are fulfilled. And it is a really great matter that, you know, we have the, some of the uh, faculty members from some of the students after this uh, university, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Pardeep, Dr. Rain Yadav, then the uh, Professor Sandeep, Professor Nan Sharma, Jay Paul, and other various priests, you know, who, uh, who are, you know, uh, working as a pillar of this university, as I said. You know, he said the foundation is very important, so I say they have become a pillar of the university, and they're contributing that uh, to the extent that how this university can grow. Uh, faster and faster with these words. I really thank uh, our uh, team speaker and uh, Madam Pawan uh, Sharma to be part of this event. And we will show you that this will continue to be the every day, every year event. And we will have uh, many uh, speakers to continue in this. With these words, I thank once again and welcome all the professors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Atam. Thank you, sir, for your beautiful words and your words of wisdom. Your blessings. Sir, Sir, Now it's time to witness the main fulcrum of today's event. That is to hear Justice A K C Kri, followed by a very brief note about him. Justice Ajay Kumar C Kri did his LLB from C L C. Campus Law Center, University of Delhi in 1977. He had been the president of Campus Law Center over there. He pursued his LNM from the Delhi University and again secured first position. Justice Sikri enrolled as an advocate in 1997 with the Bar Council of Delhi and started practicing in Delhi. He specialized in constitutional cases, labor law and the arbitration matters. He was designated as a senior advocate by the Delhi High Court on 30th of, uh, 30th of September 1997, he was appointed as judge of the Delhi High Court on 7th of July 1999. He was appointed as the acting chief justice of Delhi High Court in October 2011 and elevated as the chief justice of Punjab and Haryana 
High Court at Chandigarh in September 2012. He was elevated to the Supreme Court of India on 12th April 2013. In November 2013, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law Institute, University Lucknow, conferred him with the doctorate of law on Ristosa. He got supplemented from the Supreme Court of India in March 2019. And there have been so many landmark judgments to his credit, including the very path breaking judgment, including some of uh, them are uh, holding the const uh, that, uh, constitutional validity of Adarka, recognition of the third gender in India for the first time, disabled rights, and Zija Boss case, and Rajul Ratuvi case, and many more. The list is inclusive enough. I am not supposed to put it in the state second problem. So, given the personal attachment of Justice Sikri with Professor Sharma, I right found the days of campus law center to the uh, to his last guest. We would be highly benefited by his words of wisdom today, and it would be a great, great tribute to the great man, Professor Mulchan Sharma. May I now request Justice A.K. Sikri for delivering the very first Mulchan Sharma Memorial Lecture, please. Justice A.K. Sikri. Thank you very much. Good evening to all who have assembled today. Uh, of course, uh, a lecture by me, but in the memory of great person, uh, Professor Mulchan Sharma, well, the Vice Chancellor of the University, the Registrar, other teachers, many others who are teachers as well as his uh, erstwhile students of or who had been students of uh, Professor Mulchan Sharma who have assembled here which includes uh, Mr. Dharminder Sharma as well as Mr. Ashok Arora. Family members of uh, Professor Mulchan Sharma, Pawan, Varun and Divya and ladies and gentlemen. In the first place, let me congratulate and also profusely thank Central Haryana University for organizing this lecture series in the memory of Professor Moonchan Sharma. This is, I think, a befitting tribute to a person who had been a versatile teacher throughout his life. And he was, as everybody knows, the founder, vice chancellor of this very university. And during today's discussion only, I came to know that the uh, this hall in which you have all assembled is also named after him. I think remembering a person for his contribution during his lifetime and uh, recognizing that after he has gone is the biggest, as I said, tribute. Because many times we have this tendency of forgetting a person after he has departed or she has departed. So therefore, I said in the beginning itself that I congratulate and I thank also this esteemed university for not only remembering him this year, but by starting this memorial lecture series, he would be, he, he has become a part of this institution and he would remain a part of this institution throughout and for time immemorial, that is much, what I expect. And in the same vein, let me uh, again thank uh, the organizers for giving me a chance or giving me an honor because it is indeed an honor to be here and giving first memorial lecture in the memory of Professor Moonchan Sharma. You have chosen me and I am beholden to you for that honor which I, you have bestowed on me. Professor Sharma, actually if we see for last one uh, more than an hour, almost 70 to 80 minutes, various speakers have spoken about him. And uh, if I may say so, and that was 
even when he was alive and whenever he would meet anybody, first thing, the moment you would see him, a sense of deep reverence towards him would automatically come on your face. I mean, that was his charisma, that was his personality, those were his attributes. That the moment you meet him, you have the sense of deep respect for him. And that would automatically come on your face and your body language would reflect that. This was what Professor Mulchan Sharma was. A person with frail body structure, but with infinite uh, energy, dedication, commitment for his work. And uh, when all those who have come across him and who have seen him, I today remember the words of Einstein who spoke about Mahatma Gandhi because Mahatma Gandhi, of course, our Dr. Sharma was at least little uh, tall in uh, 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 his height. But Mahatma Gandhi, a person, short person and again a frail person like that. And uh, the kind of work which he did and naturally uh, uh, took the entire world by storm. And this is what uh, Albert Einstein uh, said about Gandhi. Generations to come, it may well be, will scarce believe that such a man as this one ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. I think that applies to, in all force, in all strength, applies to Professor Sharma. A great jurist, everybody knows, and a most adorable teacher. Apart from that, one of the finest human beings. My association with him goes back to the days when he joined law faculty, campus law center, the very first day of his joining, because I was student of LLB at that time. I tell you and the students who have studied during that period in law faculty, it was one of the finest law faculties in the world. The, the, I'm talking of faculty. The faculty members, the teachers. And uh, that is why it had attained the stature of the finest law college in the world, uh, in India at that time. And among all those stalwarts, here a person comes, a very, very young chap at that time, of immediately after doing his LLM, appointed as a teacher. Of course, he did his, um, I mean, PhD, etc. also thereafter, went to foreign university for that. But then he will be walking along with the stalwarts, those stalwarts who were teachers for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, including Professor Bakshi, who has uh, given such a wonderful message about him. Within a year, he will be rubbing shoulders with them. That is something which is, I mean, which spoke about what, how he is going to be in future and where he'll go. And that is what he proved. It was uh, actually my, I would say, misfortune in the sense that he, he never taught me. But he was during that period. As I said, he joined. I think I was in second year at that time. So for two years. But then he was my teacher as well in true sense. Because whenever we had some difficulty of any nature, be it, uh, I, I, I mean, some query relating to some uh, legal aspect of a particular law subject, or even about other administrative matter, etc. in the uh, law faculty as a student, we are facing some difficulty, we'll go to him immediately because we knew here is a person who is going to solve our problem, whatever kind. And he was that kind to each and every student. That is why, not only as, uh, uh, that is why,
Shankar said that he was one of the finest human beings, not only a brilliant teacher, and he showed his brilliance, and and uh, he proved his brilliance within a year or so, but then so much accessible to the students that whenever any student, whether he was teaching them or not, if they are in trouble and if they want some guidance, he would always be there. And that is what Professor Mulchan Sharma was. He turned out to be, as I said, great jurist and uh, not merely as a teacher, but he was reformist as well. His reforms in the field of education are well known. Much has been said and therefore I won't like to repeat all that, but he was as a law teacher and when we are wedded to the constitution and as I come to that subject and I'll speak on that, we are wedded to and we have love and respect for rule of law. Whosoever is concerned and as, as we learned as law students and from teachers like Professor Sharma. So he was human rights activist. He cherished the ideals of freedom of speech, liberty, liberal democracy, constitution and constitutionalism constitutional morality. All this, I mean, uh, 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 there has to be the very, very few persons who would command uh, the uh, uh, all these kinds of qualities. I would say that, uh, and we know, uh, when he would teach in the class, the entire class would be spellbound. Many students have already spoken about it. Law is sometimes a subject which becomes very boring subject also. I have also been a teacher in Campus Law Center and uh, during that period was with him. Uh, 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 but it is sometimes it becomes difficult to uh, contain the students or to maintain that kind of interest that they remain there in the class. But in his class, they will be spellbound. And I remember not only his students would be in his class, they would come on time and uh, would not even like to leave when the class ends. But there would be students who were in other sections and would come there and attend his class. That was his charisma. And the uh, entire thing, what is said about him, if I may say so, that his life is an inspiring book in itself. And its study, study of his life as a book, itself would provide a good lesson to all the students. So I would uh, today exhort the students of this university who are sitting here, just see what he has done, his contribution, and uh, what are his qualities. You will greatly be inspired by that. Now, therefore, I pay my humblest and my noblest tribute to Professor Sharma on this day, which happens to be, uh, I would say, a pious day and uh, a very important day for the family members. And I would say that all the persons who have assembled here today, including the students and teachers who are witnessing this program, they are members of his extended family. And uh, therefore, let us celebrate his life. Why I chose the topic of fundamental duties? When I was asked to speak, I came to know after talking to Professor Ashok Sharma, I had quite a few subjects uh, on which I wanted to speak keeping in mind the interest of Professor Sharma. And, uh, but then I was told that the students who would be attending and even the teachers would not necessarily be the teachers and students only of law because the university, they, they are from university from all over across the disciplines. So I just still wanted to have something which was dear to Professor Sharma's heart, which would be a befitting tribute to him as well 
and at the same time the audience is able to understand the message which i want to give and when i speak on this subject i would say that i am speaking today on behalf of professor sharma what professor sharma would have conveyed if had he spoken on fundamental duties so this subject is chosen that this is a subject which is a, 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 a chapter on fundamental duties which is under our constitution article 51a so on the one hand one can say that look again although you said that uh, you are not going to speak on legal topic but you want to you have picked up a topic from the constitution my answer is twofold number one that when we talk of constitution of india that then we are not talking about law only because constitution of india which i say always is the noblest book of this nation which every citizen of this country should cherish and should every citizen of this country should uh, 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 absorb the ethos and uh, should know about what it says because it is not only an instrument of governance and uh, but for a nation uh, which is a secular nation it is gita and bible and what it contains and what is the chapter of fundamental duties in any case should be known to each and every citizen of this country so that was the reason so therefore it is not a topic which relates to law as such but yes having said that article as i said that it is contained in article 51a which was introduced in the constitution later it was not uh, uh, at the beginning when the constitution was adopted uh, in the year 1950 but was inserted uh, later uh, in 70s but uh, what i am trying to say here is whenever there is a provision in the constitution of course it comes up for interpretation and there are many facets etc before the courts also and there are many judgments on uh, how article 51a is construed but i am eschewing all that discussion because i am not here speaking as a legal person to the and addressing the community which is legal community so i am not going to be legalistic about this but i am going to say generally about what fundamental duties are and how each and every citizen of this country should be concerned with these fundamental duties and is supposed to adopt these fundamental duties so that is what my endeavor is before coming to the chapter of fundamental duties i will just speak a little about because that would be relevant in the context and the uh, the, the, the thrust which i want to give to the uh, this chapter of fundamental duties uh, uh, as a non legal topic the so before that i wanted to say that uh, we are a democratic country and a democratic country and we are governed by the constitution as i said earlier is an instrument of governance which lays down various provisions as to how the three wings of the state that is the parliament or the state legislatures or that is legislature on the one hand executive the government on the second and third judiciary how they are to perform their functions so it uh, it's an instrument of governance at the same time it uh, contains other provisions to which i would come to but then it is democratically uh, 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 governed country where people choose their persons who have to rule who have to form the government who would be the legislators in the parliament and in the state legislature by election so in political science students would say that it it is founded on what we call social contract theory so instead of uh, jangal raj we have civic societies we have particular uh, model of governance here we have nation and in this nation and when we gave ourselves this constitution 
because the constitution starts with the uh, words we the people so we the people are giving ourselves this constitution so when we so it's it's an instrument which was given by the people to themselves and we said that yes here would be a democratic setup where the people will govern uh, uh, govern in what sense they will because everybody uh, 140 crore people cannot govern so therefore the ins this is some of governance is to elect the representatives who will govern on our behalf and we have right to elect and therefore they have to come again and again to us after every five years so we can throw uh, particular persons who don't govern properly we can bring other persons so therefore ultimately the power rests with the people in such a democracy but then when we elect the persons and give them carte blanche or complete power to govern in a democratic society does that mean because it is called majority rule but that, that does that mean that they have every right to govern in any manner they want answer is no as i said earlier constitution is an instrument of governance so therefore constitution prescribes the limits within which a particular government would govern even particular legislature parliament or state legislature would legislate and this is what we call limited government so government is also bound by therefore we say rule of law and at the same time social contract theory which i said also imbibes since we have uh, given power to them the people people should have same kind of freedom which and that should be ensured so therefore we have the chapter in the constitution itself chapter of fundamental rights and it contains various rights and those rights I, I, it is not necessary for me to spell out those rights because we are on duties as i said in the beginning but this uh, introduction is necessary so right if i may say uh, generally the most important rights right to equality everybody is equal in the eyes of law that that is article 14 and right to seek employment etc and this equality without irrespective of his caste creed his religion etc immaterial so everybody is equal in the eyes of law and uh, is to be treated equally before, uh, by everybody and by the government then there are certain freedoms which are given under article 19 freedom of speech so everybody has right to speak freedom of speech is given freedom of movement i have right to go anywhere in the country where i want it can't be curtailed freedom to do any business any avocation any profession which i want to do that is my freedom and uh, uh, these kinds of freedoms are given freedom of religion is in, enshrined in our constitution and most importantly article 21 of the constitution which says right to life and liberty which are constitution grant guarantees nobody has right to take away my liberty that is my freedom and my life without the process of law of course if a person has say committed murder then process of law means and he he is tried and he is convicted of that murder and if he is given death sentence his life can be taken away but that is with the process of law not otherwise so these are the rights given under our constitution and the government has to ensure that all uh, uh, enjoy their rights that is why we call it limited uh, government but then there is another chapter which is a very important chapter this is chapter fundamental rights are in chapter 3 that is chapter 4 which is uh, the uh, uh, this uh, the, the, this chapter is called uh, uh, this uh, uh, directed principles of state policy now directed principle of state policy are the uh, some of the directed principles and which are obligations put on the state on the government that you will work for the welfare of the people so this is the duty which is cast on the state so there are fundamental rights which the government has to or any uh, 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 elected persons they have to ensure for every citizen and at the same time while governing they have to work for the welfare of the people 
there are many such directive principles are given. Now, therefore, the question this arises in this whole process is that yes, as a citizen of this country, I am allowed various freedoms. So I can act in the manner in which I want. And the Supreme Court has interpreted that and particularly right to life and liberty that it is not right to life doesn't mean that uh, life only of an animal existence but right to live with dignity and that has to be ensured by the governments in power by doing welfare activities so all those rights are with me and that is what the constitution enjoys but the question that arises here is is it that as a citizen of this country that I enjoy all these rights only and, and I have no duty towards nation or Sorry, I think I was disconnected. A am I audible? Yes, sir. So, so what I was saying, so it is my duty to, am, am I privileged to enjoy all these rights and do whatever I want? And insofar as welfare of the country is concerned, economic progress of the country is concerned, that is only left to the government and I have no duty towards that. Our constitution initially, as I said, in 1950, when it was enacted, it did not take any, uh, uh, incorporate any concept of such duties on the citizens. It's a very interesting thing. Not that at the time, uh, if I tell you the constitution uh, uh, makers, that's what it is called constituent assembly. They were almost, I think, 212 or 220 persons who uh, prepared the constitution. And at that time, their, their constituent assembly debates, which tell you that when it was how each and every provision of the constitution was debated in that constituent assembly. But what I'm trying to say is that at that time also, they thought of fundamental duties. Even the uh, 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 duties were given utmost important in the Gandhian constitution of free India. Gandhi has, had come out with the constitution. And uh, uh, he had said, his Gandhian philosophy, India is essentially a Karam Bhumi, land of duty, in contradistinction to Bhog Bhumi, land of enjoyment. So therefore, it was in the mind, but what was thought? It was thought that, look, with every right corresponding duty comes. And therefore, we need not have special chapter on fundamental duties. And that is why it was not incorporated in the beginning. But then later on it was realized that no, when we, uh, after say maybe 20 years or so, because uh, it was by 42nd amendment in the year 1976, so almost after uh, uh, 30 years, going by how the people thought and how the people behaved, in first 20, 25 or 30 years. Everybody thought only of rights, as I said. Now the problem which was, and that is how I, uh, I mean, look at it, is that citizens, when they start thinking only of I, I am saying I myself only of I, and not of you, the other person, or his right, I want to enjoy my right. But then if other person also has a right, then I have certain duty towards him as a citizen and uh, we have to instead of I versus you we have to have a uh, homogeneity where we talk of we we both do uh, come together and talk of we and therefore talk or act in the interest of the nation then that is what we owe to the nation so that is what was lacking and that is why the uh, Swaran Singh committee was constituted, the, it gives it rep report and I would say that in that dark 
period of uh, uh, emergency this is the only bright side that this uh, 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 th th this uh, um, uh, constitution amendment was give, uh, passed and article 51a was uh, uh, enacted it listed 10 duties and there was in 86th amendment in 2002 was again added one more duty 11 duties and i am not going to read all those 11 duties but then just to give you a flavor and then coming on those fundamental duties i'll say that it is first duty it is fundamental duty to abide by the constitution and respects its ideals and institutions that is why i gave a little background of our constitution the national flag and the national anthem this is this becomes our duty fundamental duty to cherish and follow the noble ideas which inspired our national struggle for freedom to uphold the and this is important to uphold and protect the sovereignty unity and integrity of the nation to promote harmony and spirit of common brotherhood amongst all people of india transcending religious linguistic and regional or sectional diversities to renounce practices derogatory to the dignity of women to protect and improve the natural environment our duty towards environment then to safeguard public property and to abjure violence we know when the uh, people do all these kinds of strikes and uh, dharnas etc and how we have scanty regard for sometimes for the public property and how the public property is damaged even today then <laughs> to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity so that the nation constantly rises to a higher levels of endeavor and achievement so therefore what is contained in as i said directive principles of state policy it becomes now duty of each citizen to contribute to that and the last one which was added in 2002 was uh, who is a parent or guardian to provide opportunities for education to his child as the case may be ward between the age of 6 and 14 years. So it's a duty enjoined on every parent and every guardian that I have the duty towards my children that they get proper and better education on which I'll come. Now, uh, as I said earlier, I do not want to go into the legalistic how these duties are to be interpreted whether these duties are enforceable in the sense that if a person doesn't discharge these duties whether i can go to the court of law and say that no he's supposed to discharge etc and on that judgments i am not going into that but let me at this stage say in the context of his uh, 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 fundamental duties go a little back in the history india its past glory I have quoted Gandhiji who described India to be Karam Bhumi. It is this attribute of duties in citizens which had brought laurels to ancient India. When we look back, we always cherish about the greatness of our country. It is not only what we say about ourselves. In fact, that is the perception of many scholars of foreign origin as well about the past glory. And I would quote here Max Muller, a German scholar, what he said almost 200 years ago about India. If I, and I quote, if I were to look over the whole world to find out the country most richly endowed with all the wealth, power and beauty that nature can bestow in some parts a very paradise on earth, I should point to India. If I were asked under what sky the human mind has most fully developed some of its choicest gifts, has most deeply pondered on the greatest problems of life and has found solutions of some of them which will deserve the attention even of those who have studied Plato and Khan, I should point to India. And if I were to ask myself from what literature we here in Europe, we who have been nurtured almost exclusively on the thoughts of Greeks and Romans 
and of one Semitic race, the Jewish, may draw that corrective which is most wanted in order to make our inner life more perfect, more comprehensive, more universal, in fact, more truly human, a life, not for this life only, but a transfigured and eternal life. Again, I should point to India. This was our India and it has become now, we know on social media, on WhatsApp, you will find so many messages, so many stories about the grand, uh, grand India that it was. But are we same India today? Why we are discussing the chapter on fundamental duties? Let us have some peep in the present. What is in present time? Can we say with equal authority? I think no. Answer has to be in the negative. Even after 75 years of independence, we are facing problems of maladministration and miscarriage of justice. There are problems of poverty, hunger, malnutrition, food adulteration. Even today, we have not been able to provide potable drinking water to the entire population of this country. <coughs> Criminals are ruling the roost with large-scale crimes, including murder, decoities, and more importantly, white-collar crimes, which have assumed frightening and varied proportions. We know how, in last many years, many fugitives who, after plundering the wealth of this country, have fled to other countries. Women are still not safe. Children are not safe. In spite of so many legislation, in uh, 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 to protect the children as well as women. There are frequent incidents of rape, molestation, sexual harassment at workplace, case of bright burning and dowry deaths. Of course, they are diminishing, I would say, but still we come across such. And let me be here very candid even about our legal system. Our legal system has made life too easy for criminals and too difficult for law-abiding citizens. Because taking advantage of the loopholes, these people are, and particularly white-collar crimes, they are able to commit these crimes. I would here refer to Mr. Palkiwala, those who are students of law and are conversant with law, they would know he has been one of the finest lawyers independent India had produced a noted jurist and one of the best legal brains. He described India, Indian state of affairs about 50 years ago, 45 or so, by saying that the picture that emerges is that of a great country in a state of moral decay. We suffer from, and this is what he says, we suffer from fatty degeneration of conscience. And the melody seems to be not only persistent, but prone to aggravation. The lifestyle of too many politicians and businessmen bears eloquent testimony to the truth of the dictum that single-minded pursuit of money uh, impoverish, uh, impoverishes the mind, shrivels the imagination, and desiccates the heart. The tricolor and these are very telling words which he said, the tricolor, we have three colors of our flag. The tricolor fluttering all over the country is black, red and scarlet. Black money, red tape and scarlet corruption. This proves that we have landed ourselves from Karam Bhumi to Bhog Bhumi. If I again use the words of Mahatma Gandhi. Palki Wala had two reasons for the sordid state of affairs. He said, first as a nation, we have scant concern for public good and far too few citizens are interested in public welfare. He was talking of disregard of duties which citizens owe to the nation and which we now find in fundamental duties chapter. Secondly, he argued, there was general lowering of standards in public and in private life. According to him, 
moral and spiritual recession was worse than even economic recession. So he's again, in a way, although not directly referring to, but he hints at fundamental duties that what we owe to the nation and what we have to do. Not all, of, even after 45 years, but much of this is still true. And therefore, we have to see the chapter, as I told you, on fundamental duties and what constitution expects from each and every citizen in right spirit. What we owe to the nation, what we owe to our fellow citizens, what we owe to, the, those, uh, to those who are downtrodden, who are marginalized section of the society. And if we start doing, and it is not, as I said earlier also, not the function only of the government. Government may come out with various welfare schemes for the upliftment of the women, children, and marginalized section, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, disabled persons suffering from disability, etc. But then it becomes the duty of every person to do this. And uh, what are, of course, I have told you these are the duties. But then what what is the message behind these duties? I am. I may here uh, 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 cite or quote Cicero. He has written on, uh, I mean, his book is out there on duties, and uh, which he wrote 2000 years ago, more than 2044 BC. And he's, it is in only three part letter addressed to his son, Marcus, in which he mentions duties. And the aim, he said, aim of duties is to show how philosophy gives a proper foundation to the most practical questions of moral and social obligation. For who would presume to call himself a philosopher, he asked, if he did not inculcate any lessons of duty. And Cicero believed that the universe runs according to a divine plan and that each human being is a spark or splinter of God. Therefore, treating another person badly, doing the same thing to ourselves. He observed the ab absurdity of one who says that they will not rob or cheat a member of their own family, but puts the rest of society in another basket. So he says that it should be, and what we say, that entire world is our kutum. So that, that is almost the same thing which he is saying and uh, said that to contribute to the general good and by interchange of acts of kindness, by giving and receiving and thus by our skill, our industry and our talents to cement human society more closely together man to man. And I think that is the spirit which runs throughout our chapter on fundamental duties. And there's one other message with which I would, uh, uh, I mean, uh, close. Uh, if I may, before that, I may say, I've read out to you the fundamental duties. According to me, they fall in four baskets. Number one, duty towards nation. Number two, duty of brotherhood and promoting harmony. Number three, duty to protect environment. And number four, duty towards the children of this country. And uh, if we see each and every all the, because there are 11 duties which broadly fall in these four categories and uh, how we make ourselves ready to perform these duties. What is expected of us? These citizens, if I may say so, the duties expect to us, uh, uh, expect from us to become a better citizen. And I use the expression, better citizen means enlightened citizens. Who has been enlightened? And here I would, I have not referred at various places when I was talking about it, how Professor Sharma led this kind of life. And he was, but I may say so here at, the, uh, uh, at this juncture that he was one person who had become an enlightened citizen. And uh, 
an enlightened citizen is one who thinks that entire nation is his family and works for his family. All of us are inhabitants of India in geographical sense because we are living within India and we are citizens of this country in political sense. But are we enlightened citizens of this country? I am reminded of one anecdote. One person came, uh, a foreigner came to India and uh, there was, he, he went all over various important places for three, four weeks. And uh, there was his Indian friend who had taken him around. After four weeks when he was going back, his friend asked him, how did you find India? And you know what was his retort? India? I didn't see any India. Where is India? He said, how do you say you are in India? I said, sorry. When I went to Maharashtra, people said we are Maharashtrians. When I went to Punjab, people were saying we are Punjabis. When I went to Bengal, people were saying we are Bengalis. I did not come across a single person who had said that I am an Indian. Now, this is a great slap on our face. I may say at the same time that, look, uh, there are good things. We, we, 15th August was hardly three weeks ago. And when we celebrated our 75th uh, Independent Day, we could see that euphoria all over, that spirit of Indianhood, of loving this nation, no doubt, each and every body. And we see the same spirit when we, even uh, uh, it is uh, uh, in the, uh, the Republic Day. But why it remains only for three, four days and then dies down? That is not what an enlightened citizen should be. Of course, I may say at the end that it's not that everything is lost. If we see our, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the progress in 75 years, India has made great progress, great strides, no doubt. Till 15, 20 years ago, particularly Western countries and America, if you ask a common citizen uh, about India, he would not even know that India exists. But today, India is known everywhere. Today, 15 or 20 top companies in the world, multinationals, Indians are their CEOs. Wherever we go, we are, I mean, given the respect which we were not given earlier. And in, in India has made economic progress also. We have, the way we have progressed in supports, I mean, recent uh, uh, Commonwealth Games is the example. Before that, uh, uh, last year, this, uh, 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 Olympic is the example, the way we, uh, we have uh, started winning. India has come out in, and then we have many, many, India has produced many philanthropic persons who have cherished Indian values and who have worked for India. So therefore, everything is not lost, I would say. And COVID-19 was one, is one example where India showed solidarity. People came out to help those who were in need. And they did not uh, uh, shirk their responsibility as citizens of this country. And therefore, what I feel is, at the end, I would say that we have to imbibe all these uh, uh, values of fundamental duties. We have to not only cherish them, we have to practice them. We have to have India as our nation for which we should work and that is what is stated behind it and uh, 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 Mr. Ashok Arora is there and I know he is uh, uh, one person who is such a protagonist of uh, the uh, 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 fundamental duties and he has also written uh, about it and I, if I may uh, tell you quote from him, uh, his one of his uh, lecture which I could find out. And he said, the question is, can any captain lead a team if most of the players refuse to perform their roles? How can we think of building a nation without building the national character? That is what, uh, when I said about enlightened citizen, this national character. 
and how can we build the national character without performing fundamental duties like developing the spirit of inquiry and i told you about the dignity of a person and uh, in the context of that uh, 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 right which was added right to education to children and the fundamental duty on the parents and guardians to give that right and uh, this is what he says the right to education and right to live with dignity are meaningless unless we provide value education to enable every student to develop his her personality to its highest potentials so that is what i expect from this university that is what i expect that each and every teacher should have that in mind in so far as students are concerned and i hope and i end with quoting dr arnold tonneby who again said about i earlier quoted uh, max muller about india and he again said about uh, india and uh, what the world expects from india and i think if we discharge our fundamental duties faithfully time is not far when we will be able to regain our past glory and this is what he said and i quote it is already becoming clear that a chapter which had a western beginning will have to have an indian ending if it is not to end in its self destruction of the human race at this supremely dangerous moment in human history the only way of salvation for mankind is the indian way emperor ashoka's and mahatma gandhi's principles of non violence and shri ramakrishna's testimony to harmony of religions here we have an attitude and spirit that can make it possible for the human race to grow together into a single family and in the atomic age this is the only alternative to destroying ourselves what has been happening in last 6 or 7 months with ukraine war and the manner in which their tension is developing i think india has to take lead by showing the path and all citizens if we uh, uh, have this uh, sense of uh, our duties we will be able to do that thank you very much and i think uh, um, uh, and i thought that going by the personality of dr mulchan sharma there cannot be a better tribute to tell people about fundamental duties which he uh practice throughout his life thank you